So this is now where I stopped in the second lecture. And I wanted to just make you know, a comment about the deformation theory. So this was the, the question was about how to uh, write explicitly, because I, I didn't really say explicitly, how to write this deformation theory for fixed domain. I'm not going to say much, but what I tried to say was that, and here I wrote, I wrote it now carefully with better handwriting, is that on the modular space of maps of a fixed curve, what you have, the only structure you have, and I screwed it up here, X. The only structure you have is this uh, universal map over the moduli space to X. And from this universal structure, the deformation theory is uh, this object here, this R pi lower star F upper star TX and in the dual, and you have to map it to the cotangent complex and how to construct this map. So in some sense, the question about what the deformation theory is specifically is how to construct this map. This map tells you everything. If you want to know why this map tells you everything, then I said, then I recommend reading the paper by Fenteki and uh, Berend and Fenteki. This map tells you everything. So the question is how to construct this map. And you construct that completely tautologically from, from this geometry. And the only thing you have is differentials, tangent bundles and differentials. And I was going to write out the whole thing, but of course it doesn't fit in the margin here. And, uh, but the fact of the matter is that I had written this thing out for a class that I taught in, uh, in the fall. And I gave Andre the link. So if you go, if you go to, if you follow this link from my class notes in the fall, you will find two or three pages which just tell you how to go from this geometry to this map. And it's not original. I mean, that stuff was already explained in Kai Barron's paper uh, in slightly terser language. And I think it goes back to Ilusi. So that's uh, that's a longer answer to that question. And another comment about this is that if you're if you are new to the subject of deformation theory of maps which is very similar to deformation theory of sheaves, but has a slightly different flavor, of course, then a, a place which is things are written out very explicitly and nicely is um, in the first chapter of Janusz Kolar's book on rational curves and varieties. There's kind of an explicit discussion. Of course, it's not exactly in this, he's, he's interested in Hilbert schemes, but uh, there's, there's a pretty nice discussion, very explicit discussion of deformation theory of, of, um, well, you can interpret them as maps because a map can be interpreted as a subscheme. Uh, so I recommend you look at that. All right, so that's the uh, finishing the business from the previous questions. And I encourage people, if you actually look at these slides to send me corrections. I can't say there's been a lot of that. Uh, okay, so. I last time I finished basically with a discussion of the formula for this Virasara conjecture and then some philosophical comments about whether it could be true or where, where it's true or why people think it might be false. But uh, I wanted to uh, make a couple more points. The first one is that you see that this matrix here in the definition is the action of the canonical class or the, sorry, the first turn class of the tangent bundle, the dual of the canonical class. So you might think that the simplest case is when you have, if the first turn class is zero. And it is a very, it's, it's a very nice thing if the first turn class is zero because it wipes out um, a lot of these terms. Not all of the terms because you could have an I to the zero. That's the matrix to the zero. That's always the identity matrix, well raised or lowered. But still, if you have this, the first turn class is zero, it wipes out a lot of this, it makes the formula much better. But as I tried to explain last time, unfortunately for Klaubia threefolds, uh, this, this, uh, the Virasara constraints, you won't learn anything interesting. But you could think about other examples. Who else has C10? Well, of course, a point does. And then an exercise just to make sure that what I've been writing makes any sense is you, should, you could try to reduce the equations here to the equations that I wrote in the first lecture. I mean, this is just basically an exercise in understanding the definitions. Uh, but then a, a case which is interesting, which is genuinely interesting and new for C10 is of course the elliptic curve, E equals elliptic curve. And that's an extremely interesting case. It has another feature, which it has the odd cohomology, but Virasara takes a rather simple form there, a simple non-trivial form, and you can use it to solve the entire gromov witten theory elliptic curve and this is what is done in one of my papers with Andrea Kunkov. But I, the, if you're interested in Virasara, the case of the target being elliptic curve is a very good case to study because a lot of terms go away. 
then, so we've gotten through dimension zero, one, and three. Well, you could say, what about K trivial varieties in dimension two? Why am I skipping them? There's, for example, the K3 surface or the abelian variety. And uh, sadly, well, it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, either sadly or happily, the Gromov with invariants there mostly vanish because they're holomorphic symplectic. And so these cases are essentially wiped out and there's, there's nothing really much to say. They have an interesting gromov witten theory. That's this, what's called the reduced gromov witten theory. And one can ask about Virasara constraints in that reduced geometry, and that's a different direction and it's not really fully understood. So that's the discussion there. Okay, and I wanted to give a couple examples of how one actually uses these constraints. So in, gene, in the case of a point, I think I did explain this, that they're extremely useful and in particular, they can, you can even code them and they can very practically solve the problem for lots of genera, I mean, really pretty high gen genus. But I wanted to give an example where it's not a point. And of course, the easiest example is the curve, but I wanted to give a, a, a higher dimensional example. So we're gonna consider uh, the example of P2. And that's a, it's a beautiful example. It's a classical example. Uh, it connects to lots of things in mathematical life. So the projective plane, P2. And the basic uh, gromov whitman variance there counts to vary degrees. And this is the language of these uh, brackets. And this, I'm putting a zero here. I'm only gonna think about zero now for this example. So that's just point conditions. So we ask for these genus G degree D plane curves to pass through a certain number of points. How many points? Well, this many number of points because that's the virtual dimension. You get a number, this number is NGD. And this number is the classical. So it's, it's a little theorem that one has to prove, but that the gromov witten number here is actually enumerative and it actually counts the number of these genus G degree D curves through these many general points. And in fact, they all have to be nodal curves. And these numbers in algebraic geometry have some history and they're called the severi degrees because they were studied by severi. Uh, and one can ask to what extent these equations we know uh, constrain or determine the severi degrees. And the topic, I mean, if one wants to give a lecture about this, the, the very first place to start is of course, genus zero. And there's a fundamental equation here from quantum cohomology that's very well known. It goes back, well, it's an application of the WDVV equations and some, goes back to Konsevich. And you get this very nice equation that calculates the, the genus zero invariance. And here's the first few of them. And there's many, uh, many good, in, good expositions of uh, how to find this equation from the properties of gromov witten theory. So I won't spend much time on it. And the, the answer of how to find this equation is that uh, you have to look at the splitting axiom in gromov witten theory. And what that means is we take this, so we take the moduli space of curves, the moduli space of maps, maps the moduli space of curves, but the moduli space of curves have some divisors as we've discussed before. For example, a, a boundary divisor where I split the genus into two parts and I connect with one node. And I can take some kind of fiber product. And uh, we would like to, this would be D. We would uh, like to have some rule for how to compute the gromov witten variance uh, after intersection with this divisor in terms of the gromov witten variance of two pieces. And that's what's called the splitting axiom. And it says that, uh, well, it says that if you want to know the gromov witten variance of the full curve, you can sum over the, Gromov, the, the virtual class restricted to this divisor, that's this pullback. You can sum over the distribution of points and degrees on these two sides. So this is a splitting axiom in gromov witten theory. And it's kind of interesting. It says that in particular, it says that if you know things about MGN bar, then it gives you some constraints on the moduli space of stable maps and gromov witten variance. And this is, this is explained in terms of splitting axiom. I'm sorry, I'm going through this a little bit quickly because uh, there's been, there's lots and lots of places where you can read uh, very nice discussions about this. And the, dub, the WDV equations are obtained from the splitting axioms by taking the simplest possible relation in M04 bar. That's the relation where this boundary point is, is equal to that point in H2. And so I leave this basically as an exercise derive this recursion from, uh, from this relation and this uh, behavior of the splitting axioms. And honestly, this requires some geometric ideas. So you'll have to think about it. But this wasn't somehow my point to do the genus zero again. 
it, my point was to apply the Virasara constraints in P2. And uh, the interesting application of that is happens in genus one. But before I do that, I'll make this comment that you see here the cohomology of the moduli space of curves constrains gromov witten theory. That if I, using the splitting axiom, if I know things about the relations about the moduli space in cohomology of the moduli space of curves, I can get some actual constraints on numbers of gromov witten invariants. But in fact, the opposite is also true. That's what, in some sense, in the last decade, there's been a lot of work on that. The opposite is true, that the geometry of the moduli space of stable maps constrains the cohomology of Mg and bar. And the examples of this relate to the faber zaguet and Pixton's relations. That's not the direction of that I'm going in these lectures. But in fact, the relationship is kind of mutual that the moduli space of curves constrains maps and maps constrain the moduli space of curves. You can learn about, you can learn both things. You can learn things going both ways there. Okay, I'm sorry, that was a bit fast in the gene of zero, uh, but nevertheless we go so that, what I really wanted to explain from Virasara is genus one, and this is a much more subtle thing. It's an extremely beautiful equation. It's for the, uh, again, for CP2, the projective plane, and it's an equation in genus one. And it says that there's an equation of the same flavor. So the flavor here, th this associativity of the quantum product equation is somehow, it's a recursion and has a quadratic flavor with some polynomial and binomial coefficients. And uh, this is the equation in, in genus one. And um, as I said, this equation is much more subtle and it's less well known. It was, it's, it was written in one of the papers of Aguchi Hori Shong because they themselves saw it as an app, they, they derived it as an application of the Virasara constraints, which I will explain about. But. But one of the reasons it's kind of interesting is you might think, okay, if this is true, I should, I should try to prove it the same way that uh, the gene of zero equation is proven by taking some, maybe some e equivalence in the boundary geometry of M1 N bar, you know, taking, taking some relation in H2 of M1 N bar and pulling it back. But um, this doesn't work actually. Part of the reason is there's no interesting really relations. There's no interesting boundary relations in M1 N bar. So you can't even really start this idea. There was one in M0 N bar that was this cross ratio relation I explained, but in M1 N bar, just, there isn't even one to start with. So that then it leads to a little bit of a puzzle. Why could this relation looks like it's a shadow of something like that, but there's, a, there's no, so to speak, object to be shadowed. Nevertheless, you can look at it, as I said, that it, it appears in this paper of Aguchi Hori Shang as an application of the Virasara constraints, when maybe when they wrote it, maybe it wasn't so clear the Virasara constraints were true for P2, but uh, they did it and then they calculate some numbers and you see that the, it gives the correct numbers. This is maybe the first interesting one. Uh, and so I wanted to explain how you get this as a consequence of, uh, of um, the Virasara constraints. You can also do it from Getzler's relation that was later found by M14, but I don't want to explain that. That's a much more complicated relation. And the derivation there is much more complicated. The, the best derivation of this equation is from the Virasara various, various constraints for uh, CP2. And, uh, and since those are proven, this is actually a proven equation. So how to prove this? So I give you some uh, steps. So the first thing is what, which of the Virasara constraints am I supposed to write down? Well, I'm telling you, you write down L1. And then what do I do? Well, I take Virasara constraints, say L1 of this uh, partition function is zero. So I'm going to study this L1 partition function divided by the partition function. This is a standard thing to do. And um, I put some slides in the first lecture to explain why this is a standard thing, but it's easy to explain. So I explain again here, is that the Z is kind of X of F. We like F, F is the connected invariants and they're a little bit nicer, easier to think about. And when you take some differentiation, of z, this is the same thing, and it will not surprise you when I write this. <laughs> it's the rule for differentiating the exponential like this. So it's nice to consider terms like that because this is equal to just the derivative of f, okay? So it's kind of standard when uh, looking at these various R constraints that you look at it like this. So I say you take this uh, L1, you look at this uh, expression, 
and extract a particular coefficient. Why lambda to zero? Because I want genus genus one and the exponent there is two G minus two. Why this? Well, this, these are 3D minus one point conditions. So it's one fewer point condition, but this L1 is an operator and it'll put one more point condition. So if you take this particular exact expression and extract a particular coefficient, you'll find an equation. And this equation will have leading term in some, in, you know, in some aesthetic sense, but anyway, one of the terms will be exactly what you're searching for. It's exactly, so this is the term we're searching for. This is our goal and it'll have some coefficient. And when you do this, you'll be happy to find a nine. That's good news because this has a nine. This formula has a nine in it. There's the nine. And this nine is produced from the, these combinatorial coefficients here. And Virasara, maybe I'm being too specific about this, but you know, it's, it's produced by these, these terms. Actually, it's produced by this one. Exactly at the dilaton shift. So that'll make you happy, you'll find the nine. That's like half of the proof already, finding that nine. And uh, then there'll be a lot of other terms. And you have to go, uh, you have to go exactly write every single other term that occurs because after you finish writing it, then you get to say that, that the sum is zero. And, and all of those other terms will be uh, inductive terms. They will fill out these terms. And when you do that, you'll find that you'll need, you'll need to be able to remove things like this. A tau one with a hyperplane class or a tau two with a uh, uh, identity class. And these insertions are hard to remove in general, but we're in genus one. And then there's another idea about how to remove them. I mean, the old ideas were string and divisor equation, but there's a new idea called this topological recursion. And I've written it for you. And it comes from a certain boundary equation in M11 that the um, cotangent line is, is related to the, the, the boundary like this with a 112th, I guess. So in the end, you do use a little boundary geometry of M11. I've written that equation for you. And this is a really good exercise to do if you uh, really want to know what's going on. And in some sense, I've told you every step. If you just apply it, you can't go wrong, but it, it takes a, some time to get all the constants and everything correct. And it's very satisfying then to find the answer. It, and it makes you believe the Virasara constraints more if you do it. And uh, if you're too lazy to do all that, at the end of these notes, um, I've uh, appended the, the full derivation written by Long Ting Wu. So he just does it all. It's not that long, but in order to get it right, you have to be pretty careful and get all the coefficients right. All right, so that's the first, uh, in some sense, one could say, the first application of uh, Virasaro past the point, uh, and it produces something that's really geometrically non-trivial. In fact, I only know two, two proofs of this, one from the Virasaro, one from Getzler's relation uh, in codimension, uh, in algebraic codimension two, and that Getzler's, the, the, the derivation using Getzler's equations is pretty complicated. This is much better. But I, for example, there's many other approaches to counting curves in the plane. And I don't know how to get this equation from any of them. So maybe if someone knows, you could tell me, like, for example, the tropical curve counting or the uh, caparozo Harris recursions and things like that. If you know, tell me. But it's a, it's a little bit of an interesting equation. OK, so that was uh, that is more or less the end of what I want to say about, uh, oh, no. I, well, yeah, you could ask for genus 2. Sorry. We discussed genus 0 and genus 1. And it's natural to ask for a higher genus. Are there any higher genus recursions? And the answer is yes, but they're much more complicated. They're not of the simple form that I just explained for genus zero and genus one, or at least I don't know any. They uh, are more complicated forms and they involve add additional recursions for descendants. And uh, it is the case that uh, you can solve everything from gromov witten theory in many different ways, but in particular using Virasaro and some generalizations of the TRR and Gothman has a nice article about that. There's other ways to do the uh, severity degrees uh, and these other ways tend to ha have to do with degeneration of P2. And you can do that uh, within classical algebraic geometry or using the degeneration formulas. And you get, uh, well, you get some degenerations which are effective and solve the problem also. But these degenerations also introduce 
uh, many more new uh, problems you have to solve recursively. So you, you never find these very clean things that we found in genus zero and genus one. All right, so that's the end of the discussion there. And now I think I finished the lecture from yesterday. Yeah, so I, yeah, I, I encourage you to either do this yourself or read Long Ting's uh, derivation here carefully. Okay, so I have to get a new uh, slide. And I think that for this, let's see if I can do it here. Um, maybe it's this one. Uh, discard. Oh, wow, it worked. All right, so we finished two lectures now, maybe a little bit late, but we did finish them. And uh, they, they were about moduli of curves, moduli of maps with a, a lot about descendants. Maybe I'd say a focus on descendants. I tried not to be too distracted and going in other directions. And the reason for that, and of course about Virasaro. And the reason for that is now we're going to switch to sheaves. And again, the focus eventually is going to be on descendants and also Virasaro. And some, somehow that's the, the part of this lecture, which is relatively recent, it is, is about uh, transferring the Virasara constraints to uh, sheaf theory, the descendant theory of sheaves. And you get some, you get some very nice e equations there. And I wanted to explain that, what happens there. But uh, so to do that, I first have to explain moduli of curves, moduli of maps and virus are there, and this is complete. And now I have to tell you about the numeration of sheaves. So we start from the beginning. So a fundamental property of gromov witten theory, which one takes for granted when one studies gromov witten theory is that it's uniform for all X. And it turns out this is very, this is a really great thing about gromov witten theory. That uh, if I take any non-singular projective variety of any dimension, there is a moduli space of maps. It has the same definition. There is a, a virtual class. It has basically the same definition. And the theory of uh, integration against the virtual class exists. And that definition is uniform for everybody. And as I said, that one takes that for granted, but it becomes clear that that's special when one starts counting sheaves. The sheaf problem is a little bit different. So you know, the idea of a map is that you map, you're, you're counting maps from curves to X. If, you're, if the sheaf counting problem is more delicate and the standard theories of sheaves counting sheaves on X are for uh, dimensions less than or equal to three. Recently, there's been work by Richard Thomas and Oak, very interesting work on Clavier fourfolds. And so we could say, why is this? Why is it for gromov witten theory, we can, we can take any target, but for sheaf counting, we have to take low dimensional targets. Well, one way to say that is that, well, gromov witten theory is really getting a, around the problem because we're in gromov witten theory, we're only, contain, we're only uh, counting maps of curves. And when you count sheaves, you know, sheaves could be also any dimension, they could be supported on any dimensional subvarieties. Uh, this is part of the answer. It's not the full answer because even the sheaf counting problem, which is related to one dimensional uh, subvarieties does not work in all dimensions. So that's only part of the answer. But when we get to the kind of the, the, the real nuts and bolts of the answer, it's about this deformation obstruction theory. So what's the reason for the difference? So as I explained before, when I look at a map from a curve to a target X, the deformation theory is controlled by H naught. That's the deformation. The, tang the, um, the deformations are given by tangent fields and the obstruction space is given by H1 of the pullback of the tangent sheaf. And this is always two term. Well, you could say, what about the infinitesimal automorphisms? And this is, those are killed by map stability. Map stability kills those. So we have exactly this two term uh, obstruction theory and that's a uniform for all targets. And so what goes wrong or what happens for sheaves? So for sheaves, we have some X and let's just say it's X is non-singular projective variety. And we want to count some, uh, count sheaves. So that means we, have, we should have some moduli space of sheaves and have some kind of counting theory. And so let's look at what the deformation theory for that is. Well, first of all, there's infinitesimal automorphisms and uh, sheaves kind of always have some, and that's given by HOM of the sheaf to itself. And sheaves always have some HOM unless you, I mean, just if you have just a naked sheaf, you'll always have some HOM 
because you can you can always have the scalars, the complex numbers acting by scalars. If you have sheaves with sections and other things, you maybe can kill the homs. But uh, if I just have this bare sheaf, it ha always has an hom, and we try to kill these homs, and this is mostly killed by sheaf stability. If you if you have a stable sheaf, then the only hom can be the complex numbers, the scalars. That almost kills it, but still it leaves a little bit more we have to fix. And this get, this leads to the idea of traceless x and things like and you know some some additional complexities. And the def the deformations of the sheaves are get x one, the obstructions and x two. So this is I think the subject and Richard spent some time on this. At least that's what I've I've uh, heard. And then there's some higher obstructions. So you have to at least consider these x. And uh, the traditional way to confront this problem is you kill the infinitesimal in the infinitesimal obstructions. You kill this basically by stability in the traceless condition, and you kill these guys, the higher x, by dimension constraints on x. So you somehow run out of room there, and then in good situations you have only these two, and you get a deformation obstruction theory, this two-term, and you uh, obtain a virtual class and have a good counting theory. Uh, but you see that this is now much more delicate than what happened here. So I wanted to do some ex examples. And these are fun examples. So this, this is the, what we're aiming for is dimension three, and we'll get there. But there's a lot of nice things along the way I want to point out. So the first example is dimension one. That's when x is dimension one. Has dimension one. So what is dimension question, one? This... We have a, a question here. Yeah. So these, these higher obstructions. Yeah, I think we discussed last week that like, I think we said something like all the obstructions live in the x2 space, but this is for like extending from like some order k deformation to k plus one deformation. So maybe this is means something else. Yeah, That's I mean, true. it means that, yeah, I think that, that you have to consider if you want this, well, if you want the this x theory to give a uh, perfect obstruction theory in the language of Berend and Fantecki, then you need that you need something like this high. You need these higher obstructions to vanish. But it, it, it is true that somehow they're not all necessary. But, but it's not the case that they all vanish. I mean, if it's not the case, I can just forget this and just say that that I have a a, a obstruction theory, a perfect of two term perfect obstruction theory for sheaves for x one and x two for any space. That that's just false. And one um, one symptom of that being false is that one thing about a two-term obstruction theory is that you always have virtual dimensions or uh, actual dimensions are always higher than virtual dimensions. And when you have these x higher, you can have some problems with that. But I think it is true that you don't really need to consider all of them. But to the extent exactly which ones that you have to consider may be a little bit delicate. My view is that I'd like them all to be zero. <laughs> okay, so dimension one is a is a the in some sense the easiest case, and then X is a non-singular projective curve of genus G. And we're looking at sheaves on a curve of genus G, and this is a really old subject. Well, 50 years old, maybe more by now, 60 years old. And and the uh, what what you get there, the first if you, when you apply ideas of stability, you get the moduli space of stable bundles. And the simplest case is when the rank and degree are co-prime. And uh, this is already non-singular with expected dimension since this higher X all vanished because we're on curves. So from this point of view, uh, everything's perfect for the moduli space of stable bundles. The virtual counting is the actual counting. The, from, the, from the theoretical point of view, there's no problems. And of course, there's many variations of this, like Higgs bundles and things like this. Another problem in, in dimension one, not as well studied as the moduli space of stable bundles is the quote scheme. So the quote scheme is you have some non-singular, well, you have this curve and I take some vector space CN. You can make more general ones. This is the, the basic one. So you have some rank and trivial sheaf and you consider the quote scheme of quotients of that. And then you have to fix some numerical invariance. And for a curve, you just have to fix the rank and the degree of f. And this obstruction theory was considered by uh, Marion and Oprah, Oprah, 
And, and the idea there is the deformations. So now we're not doing deformations of sheaves exactly. It's a quote scheme. The quote scheme is a deformation of this quotient sequence. And, but that has a deformation theory that's given by X of the sub to the quotient. And the uh, deformation space is this HOM space and the obstructions are this X one. And for our curves, there's no higher X. And so we get a, a two term obstruction theory there. And it's not exactly this one because uh, we've, it's not the same problem. It's a quotient problem. But anyway, it's a, it's a, it gives us a virtual class. And this is an interesting virtual class. Unlike here, the virtual class just gave the ordinary fundamental class, which is interesting in its own right, but it's not new and interesting. Here, the quote scheme is in general singular of mixed dimension. But uh, because of this deformation theory, this, the deformation theory anal analysis, it carries a virtual fundamental class, which is a very interesting thing. Even though the geometry might think is simple, it's just it's just uh, sheaves on curves, which is a you know very under well understood I would say by now geometry. But uh, this virtual class is a new class there, and the first exercise, if you want to, if you want to have any idea of what I'm saying, or maybe you already do, but if you want to learn it, compute the virtual dimension. It's not a hard exercise; you just have to apply uh, Riemann rock to the right thing, and you find the virtual dimension is given by this formula. Uh, on an open set, this quote scheme is just a moduli space of bundles with sections. That, uh, and Alina Marian and Dragos Oprea use this idea to transfer integrals from this moduli space of stable bundles to, uh, so I should say on an open set is the moduli space of stable bundles with sections. That's why we have an open set. They use this idea to transfer integrals on the moduli space of stable bundles to this quote scheme. That's a really interesting idea. Um, because the quote scheme, you know, just, if you just look at it from far away, it's just like bundles with some sections. Uh, it's, it's a tricky thing to transfer the integrals because you have to make sure whatever, inter, whatever intersection problem you're doing if you want to transfer it, you have to make sure, well, maybe there's a dimension shift. So you have to shift the dimension of the problem. And also you have to make sure that all the action is happening in the locus where it's stable bundles with sections. So there's some analysis of how you have to throw out the pathologies, but they get it to work exactly there. And, and then they can actually, then you can use this path to uh, transfer integrals uh, to this, against the, to this virtual class. And then, and then they can actually compute the integrals. This gives a, a proof of the Verlinda formula. There's many proofs of the Verlinda formula, but this one uses the virtual class of this quote scheme. And why is this useful? Because the point is once you get to this quote scheme, then there's a C star action. And this, you can look at this torus localization and the virtual, the localization of, of the virtual class. I haven't discussed that here, but there are techniques. So this localization as a basic technique by Atiyah Bot bot and idea bot that tells you how to calculate intersections and or integrals on varieties with uh, torus actions in terms of the fixed point data. And there's a version of that theory with respect to the virtual class that I developed with, with Tom Graber. And why that's useful is because while these spaces are kind of complicated, the fixed points with respect to the C star action, C star action scales the different, different coordinates of this complex vector space. The fixed point actions are very simple. They're just products of, they're just symmetric products of the curve. And so this idea is used to transfer complicated integrals to maybe complicated integrals and then localization that trans transfers them to integrals and products of the curve. And there they can be solved. So that's, the, that's something in dimension one. And I wanted to just explain one more thing in dimension one because it's kind of fun is that, uh, so why you get the symmetric product of the curve is that if I take the quote scheme with just one copy, of the, of the trivial sheaf, that's quotient of the trivial sheaf, that's a symmetric product. But you can do something kind of a little bit stranger, which is you, you can do quotients of n copies of the trivial sheaf. That means you look at here, this middle fellow is still CN and I wanna look at some quotients, but I ask for this rank to be zero. So it's like some kind of generalization of the symmetric product in some strange way. I look at the, uh, rank zero quotients of the n-dimensional sheaf for curves. So this is some kind of punctual quote scheme. I don't know exactly the name for this thing. 
but it's in some ways generalization, the symmetric product. And uh, exercise here, the deformation theory exercise is that this object, this punctual, punctual quote scheme, if someone has a better name, you can tell me what that is. This punctual quote scheme is a non-singular of this dimension and this virtual class is the usual, usual fundamental class. So the, uh, the virtual counting here agrees with the actual what's physically happening. And then there's a lot of stuff that happens on this space. So for example, there's tautological bundles. And if you're familiar with the theory of the Hilbert scheme, none of this will surprise you. If you take a vector bundle of rank E on X, I can move that to be uh, a certain tautological bundle on this punctual quote scheme. And it's, and it's demand, the rank of the tautological bundle uh, increases by a factor of D. It's the bundle whose, whose fiber over a particular point of this quote scheme is uh, H naught of F tensor E. So this is a kind of standard move in the study of Hilbert schemes of points. So this has not been so well studied, I would say, and I'll give you an interesting property that came up in a paper with Dragos. It's, it's some kind of uh, ex exchange property. It says that if I want to calculate the integral over this punctual quote scheme for this tautological line bund for a tautological bundle associated with line bundle, and I take the segregate class, that's the same thing up to some sign as doing it in rank one over the symmetric product, but taking n powers of the same segregate class. The segregate class is the you know, so segre of a bundle is equal to one over the total churn class. So there's some kind of uh, interesting symmetry here and we proved it by doing some calculations, but I always wondered whether there should be some kind of proof of this without doing any calculations. So that's a challenge understand what I've said and find a conceptual proof with no calculations. Because you're kind of swapping this N. This is some kind of higher, higher rank punctual quote scheme and this property swaps it down to rank one. But of course, a little bit, there's a price to pay. You have to put the N here. All right, so that was dimension one. Dimension two, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff in dimension two. And I think a lot of Richard's lectures were, were about that. I will take go to this dimension two with a slightly different uh, focus. So let X be a non-singular projective surface. I think the simplest theory for this dimension two is again, the quote scheme and precisely this quote scheme. So X is a surface now. And I again, look at quotient to the trivial sheaf. And uh, this quotient has the quotient F and has the kernel G. And unlike the case for curves, which I didn't have to make any assumption. I just took any quote scheme for curves. The uh, obstruction theory is two term and I get a virtual class. Now for surfaces, because the dimension has increased, I have to, I have to pay for that some way in the sheaf theory. Uh, as I said, in, in the sheaf theory, you always pay for increasing dimension. And how I pay for that is I ask for this uh, quotient to be rank zero. That means generic rank is zero. And what that means in practice for a surface is it's supported on curves. So I don't ask for every possible quotient. I just want for quotient. I only consider quotients that are supported on curves. So such a quotient has a first turn class and has an Euler characteristic. It doesn't have a rank because the rank is zero. Well, and in papers with Marian Aprea, we investigate the uh, obstruction theory for these quote schemes. And this is motivated by several things, but in particular their work in dimension one, and the deformations are as before. It's given by the HOM. And then there's the obstruction so that what we have to worry about is killing these higher obstructions. And so this X2 here is a uh, ser dual to a certain HOM. And it's precisely to kill this HOM that we have this rank zero because then F is a torsion sheaf, but the right-hand side uh, is a subsheaf of some torsion free sheaf. So this HOM is killed since F is a torsion free, since F is a torsion sheaf. So in this generality, I said here, this X is killed and this, every time you see such a quote scheme, it has an obstruction theory and a virtual class and you know, a full enumerative theory. You could say, can we ever remove this torsion hypothesis? And the answer is yes. 
if x is Fano, I think we can remove it, or maybe to some other small assumptions. But, but the idea, but this direction of removing this torsion hypothesis and paying for it with some additional geometry on x is, a, is an interesting direction that's mostly unexplored. I think we did a few calculations there. And uh, you can calculate the virtual dimension of this quote scheme, and there's a formula, and it's essentially a riemann roch calculation, which uh, I leave to you. And the interesting thing is, what are the integrals here? And this is going to be some kind of foreshadowing of what we do for uh, three folds and descendants. And there's different ways to study this theory. You can study it in, in, in numerical theory or K theory. But the, the way to get uh, some tautological objects on this uh, quote scheme is by this, the construction in some sense we already saw. So you start with a K theory class on X. That's what we did for a curve. The K theory class on X with a line bundle or a vector bundle. You pull it back to, uh, to um, X cross the quote scheme. And X cross the quote scheme has a universal quotient. That's why I've kind of drawn it as curly. And then I can take R pylor star and get a K theoretic class on this quote. So it's a way of taking a K theory class on X and getting a K theory class on the quote scheme. And that's just that this is rather familiar operation. And we're going to interpret this eventually as descendants. And if you want to write an integral, the most general kind of descendant integral you can write is I take this quote scheme and I sum, I have to sum over something. So I'm freezing the curve class and I sum over the degree of, I sum over the Euler characteristic. That's this degree sum. And then I put in the churn characters of this K theory, these tautological K theory classes I've uh, constructed. And as I said, the, we will later interpret these kind of things as descendants that are parallel to our descendants in gram in theory. And that parallel will be made rather precise. But here it's a little, it's a little here it's in some sense more just uh, words. But I view these as descendant insertions. And since I have a growing, I have a growing virtual dimension, I need to put some other class in. So the standard thing to put here is the total turn class of the virtual tangent bundle. And the motivation for this comes from different ideas. But one of them is if I just get rid of this, like I, this thing gives me the, if I don't have any classes here, this gives me the virtual Euler characteristic. So that's the, that's the you know, full theory for quote schemes of surfaces and the generality that you can do for any surface. And you could say, can you solve this theory? And the two basic ideas that come in this, in the, when one tries to solve it, there's two basic ideas. The first one is rationality. And that says that this generating series in Q, the one we've just defined here, um, it, maybe it looked crazy here and you, and you thought that this integrands were uh, inserted haphazardly, but there's something about that which says this is definitely not the case because the first conjecture is that this is always the Laurent expansion of a rational function in Q. So this is, it's born as some kind of uh, infinite series. It can have some negative parts, only finally many negative parts. Uh, but in fact, the, we conjecture that this is always a, a Laurent expansion of a rational function in Q. And in fact, this, this conjecture is proven in many cases. I didn't list all the cases, but you can look in these various papers. Um, the last one with, with Noah, so there's, well, there's, there, there's four papers here. Wunan Lim and Johnson and, and the last paper with Noah Arbusfeld that's in a K theory, but it proves this kind of rationality things in many, many cases, but not exactly all cases yet. You, you have to go look and see if you want to find out where we know we don't know it's uh, a uh, rational function, but most cases it, it is. So this thing's actually true for the most part. So that, uh, that already shows that there's something magical going on with this kind of insertions. And then you could say, can you actually cal calculate it? And, that's one thing nice for these quote scheme the theories, which I indicated uh, before, and in, in fact, was what uh, Alina and Dragos used, is that uh, they're very computable because there's this torus action that reduces to rank one. In some sense, that's the, that's the kind of nice thing about these quote scheme theories. In, in some sense, that they're higher rank because they allow for, they allow for these quotients to be uh, higher rank objects in this case, higher rank on the curve. But on the other hand, they have this torus action which reduces them to some kind of rank one object. 
And so you can actually do this calculation. And I gave one example, but we've done many cal calculations in different uh, configurations, but the, the calculation, the most general calculation that shows the theory is solvable is this uh, exact solution for the case when X is a simply connected minimal surface of general type with non-singular rational, non-singular canonical curve. So you can forget all of this. You can say it's a minimal, if you have a surface of general type, that's a lot of surfaces. And to write this formula nicely, and you don't need to have all these hypotheses, I just wanted to write it nicely. So it's a minimal surface with a non-singular canonical curve. And the non-singular canonical curve, of course, has a genus. So I'm going to write the formula in terms of genus of that. And it says that this, uh, this series, and now I'm not putting any of the descendants in. This is just the virtual, this is a series in some sense for the virtual uh, Euler class. The basic series is given uh, by some sign, which is an interesting number related to the cyber written invariant, some Q shift, and then uh, some functions. And this should be a rational function. How are we going to get a rational function? It turns out you have to look at uh, the roots in W of a certain polynomial. It's this polynomial equation. So view this as a polynomial equation for W in terms of Q and it has n distinct roots. And to get the rational function, you have to sum over uh, all choices of uh, these many of the distinct roots. And what function do you sum? It's, well, it's an interesting function. It's this function. That's a symmetric function. And you can, this, this, so this shows that the answer is a uh, rational function, because it's a symmetric function of these roots. Uh, and it gives a complete solution to this problem. For these, for these virtual other characteristics in all cases, in all of these, uh, sim these minimal surface, sorry, sorry, simply connected general types uh, surfaces. So this is a kind of showing this theory is really computable. And in the papers, there's lots of other computations. But what, what are we after in these computations? Well, so the first thing that comes in this is that, that, that you see in this is that there's this uh, factor minus one to the Euler characteristic of the holomorphic Euler characteristic of O. And this is the, uh, turns out this number, this very simple number is the uh, Gromov, is the gromov witten invariant. And this is an old relation that goes back to this Gromov equals cyber witten theorems of Taubes. But for such a surface, a surface of general type, there's one basic gromov witten invariant, which is counting the genus G curves in the class, in the canonical class. And that's given by a sign. And actually, that's the whole action in this. This whole the whole action in this formula is that. The rest is something universal. So what this says is that actually that uh, the gromov witten theory and this very I mean that this it's saying somehow that this enumerative geometry of this quote scheme is some kind of uh, complicated manifestation of the curve counting in gromov witten theory. So that, that already shows that there's some kind of connection between these curve and sheaf counting. And what we're going to do for threefold is, is somehow a much richer exploration of that. Now, I wanted to make some comment about some of the topics that Richard talked about. That's the sheaf counting on surfaces. A more sophisticated theory, significantly more sophisticated, was proposed by Vafa and Witten and defined mathematically by Tanaka Thomas. And it, it takes a lot more delicate work to define the virtual class there. And one of the things that you get out of it, which is nicer, is that uh, it's more closely related to the moduli of bundles on, on the surface. And the idea for this Vafa Witten construction is that you should move to dimension three. You some, somehow approach this sheaf counting on this a surface by looking at sheaves rather not on the surface, but the total space of the canonical bundle. So it's harder to define and it's harder to calculate. And one of the, one of the things that comes out of it is the rational functions that are found in the quote scheme theory are replaced by modular, in some sense, replaced by modular forms in this waffle witten theory. And, and I refer you to various results and conjectures of Goethe and Kuhl. But one of the hopes I've always had is that there should be some way to transfer maybe not the virtual Euler characteristic, but transfer integrals from 
the moduli of bundles to this quote scheme theory as what happened in dimension one. And the advantage for that would be that these are very computable. All right, so I leave you with some ideas there you can explore. So this is to show that this sheaf counting is already quite interesting in dimensions one and two, but we are primarily gonna be interested in dimension three. And dimension three is the most interesting dimension for counting. It's like the perfect dimension for counting. And there are many directions of study and I'm not gonna cover these because there's too many. You can think about this in terms of mirror symmetry or DT wall crossing, stability conditions, refined invariance. There's a long list and it's an incredibly interesting subject that's going developing in many different ways. But I'm going to start at the simplest place. So I want to count sheaves in dimension three and uh, the simplest moduli space of sheaves in dimension three, which more or less is familiar in some ways to most algebraic geometers is the Hilbert scheme of curves. So the Hilbert scheme of curves, so I take X to be a non-singular projective threefold and I use this notation here. I, the I is for ideal sheaves because I'm going to view this Hilbert scheme as, as a moduli space of ideal sheaves. And uh, there's two discrete invariants, N and beta. So N is the holomorphic Euler characteristic of the quotient curve and beta is the fundamental class in, in homology of the curve. So an element of the Hilbert scheme is a quotient where I take, uh, well, that's a, the quotient has a quotient and an ideal sheaf. And the reason I, it's an ideal sheaf is because it's, it's a one, it's, it's not the quote scheme, it's the Hilbert scheme. So there's only one copy of O. So we can consider the Hilbert scheme as a moduli space of ideal sheaves. This is kind of an important conceptual point. So I would say that normally in algebraic geometry, when one looks at the Hilbert scheme, one looks at the Hilbert scheme as uh, some parameter space of quotients. But you can also look at it as a parameter space of ideal sheaves. And not always, but in this case, it turns out that's a very profitable thing to do. So we view Hilb as a moduli space of ideal sheaves. And you could say, is it, so this, is, this, is, this statement has some kind of theorem in it, which is to say that if I take this ideal sheaf and I look at its intrinsic moduli, I try to deform it. This, this theorem is saying that actually in this case of curves on threefolds, that moduli space of ideal sheaves is just actually the Hilbert scheme, which is to say that when I deform this ideal sheaf, when I finish deforming it, actually it stays an ideal sheaf in a canonical way and gives me a quotient. So there's something to prove there. And of course you might object. You could say that I could change the first churn class of ideal sheaf. And then of course it won't. And that's true. That's why you have to say actually trace free deformations. So in, in actually in the moduli of sheaves, there's, there's always the issue about whether you're controlling the, the deformation of the determinant or not. Okay, but so this is a kind of technical point, but uh, it is the case, it's true here, and it's a little bit remarkable that uh, the moduli space of ideal sheaves of, of this, the moduli space of this sheaf coincides with the quote scheme. Sorry, the Hilbert scheme. And just to make sure that uh, we are on the same page, we really consider the entire Hilbert scheme. So if you take X and you look at the Hilbert scheme of curves, a lot of fuzzy stuff can happen. You can have some kind of smooth curve that looks pretty good, but then you could have some embedded points or you could just have some non-reduced points running around by themselves, or you could have some monster where you have some very singular curve and there's a nilpotent structure generically and then additional nilpotent structure at the singularity. We're considering it all. And this was, uh, the topic developed in Richard Thomas's PhD thesis, which was to, to show that, I mean, the first part to show that this uh, object has a two-term obstruction theory. And there is some subtlety in that. So first of all, as uh, I said, that we're supposed to, the first thing, and this is, you know, if you go look in Richard's thesis, you won't find all these statements I'm saying, but the first thing is to consider this as this moduli space of ideal sheaves. He, he did that at the beginning. Yeah, I don't think he was, he didn't, he didn't write about this as the Hilbert scheme. The, the moduli space of ideal sheaves. And then, as I said, we have a problem with these scalars. There's X zero, there's X one, X two, we're happy with that. And there's X three, which we should kill. 
And how do you kill x3? Well, that, uh, so it turns out both x0 and x3 are killed with the same idea, which is that, uh, that you have to look at not the deformation theory of ideal sheaves, but the, the uh, theory of traceless deformations. And this is explained very well in Richard's uh, PhD thesis. So I encourage you to look at it. But, so there's a, the traceless deformation theory is deformation that uh, preserves the determinant. And you want to express that into X, just like normal deformation theory of, of sheaves is just uh, allows the determinant to wander how it wants. And that's given by this X. If I want to fix the determinants given by traceless X, and this traceless X kills this C, so it's going to kill this guy. And by serial duality, it turns out also kills that. So by going to the traceless deformation theory, it's two term perfect obstruction theory. And the traceless X is defined uh, using X and the kernel of the trace map. And as I said, I, I recommend looking at what R Richard wrote. That's, a very, that's, that's developed very nicely there. So the, the summary is that this moduli, this, this Hilbert scheme of curves in X, which is a kind of classical object, I would say. Something familiar to algebraic geometers. If I do the first move is look at it as a moduli space of ideal sheaves, and then do the second move, which is what, what Richard does in his thesis, is look at the traceless deformation theory of the moduli space of ideal sheaves. Then this Hilbert scheme carries a uh, virtual fundamental class, obstruction theory in a virtual fundamental class. So it's a kind of a little different way of looking at it than what's traditional in algebraic geometry, I would say. It's the same object, but you look at it slightly differently. And that's a beautiful thing. And I mean, this virtual, this deformation theory in the virtual class. And the first exercise is calculate the virtual dimension. And if you do, you'll find something kind of remarkable. The virtual dimension, this thing has two discrete invariants, this Euler characteristic and the curve class. And if you calculate the virtual dimension that you'll find that uh, it depends only on the, on the beta. It doesn't depend on n, it's independent of n. So this is kind of um, a little bit strange. You might think that as you're giving, you know, this n is uh, the Euler characteristic. And you could say you're somehow twisting your sheaves by some point somewhere, but the virtual dimension doesn't care. It doesn't give you any more virtual dimension for doing that. Even though the moduli spaces might be growing a huge amount, but virtually they don't. And if I, if I want to integrate against this, I'm allowed now, this is a virtual class, I can integrate against this moduli space, this Hilbert scheme or ideal sheaves, and that's, this integration is called Donaldson-Thomas theory. And now what about gromov witten theory? It turns out gromov witten theory also has an independence property with virtual dimension. If I look at the moduli space of stable maps to X, where X is a threefold, it's also independent of one of the parameters. Now it's independent of the genus, which is also a strange thing. Because normally you think when you're mapping curves to varieties, the genus is going to matter because it controls how many line bundles and there's brill nother theory, but virtually it does not matter. And moreover, these dimension formulas are the same. The dimension formula for the Hilbert scheme and the dimension formula for the moduli space of curves, they're the same. They're the same in the sense that the right-hand side is the same. The left-hand side is different. And it's not even clear what I mean by they're the same because there's a G here and there's an N there. But I would say that they're kind of strikingly similar. So uh, the simplest place to, to do this now is for Klabia threefolds, but maybe I should stop. We can do that tomorrow. It's also clear from this calc. So we, here we made no assumption on Klabia of X, but it's clear from uh, if you, the Klabia condition is going to help us because it's going to make not only the virtual dimensions uh, independent of n, it's just going to make them all zero, independent of beta too. And this is a this is some kind of a sign about the Calabia threefold. So first of all, if you're doing enumerative geometry, dimension three is the best dimension. And if you're if you're counting in dimension three, Calabia is, is the perfect place. And roughly speaking, the reason for that in one line is that if you're almost all the I, I mean, okay, I'll try to say it in the exaggerated way that all counting problems have dimension zero on Calabia threefold. So this, this statement is kind of the first order true and that's why it's the perfect place for counting. So we'll start on that next time.
So I'll stop now. Any questions? I have one in the So the question is how the sort of constraints depend on stability? Uh, stability of, um, you mean the stability of the curve? Uh, the anonymous questioner did not say, but. So I, I think that maybe you could say, I, I, okay, maybe then I just try to interpret it. So I, I was talking about a certain, I mean, like for curves, it was the like Deline Mumford stability. You could try to change stability conditions for curves, and that you have choices there. Actually, it's, I'm, I'm hearing some kind of echo. Do I, should I? Should I just ignore it or what? Anyway, so you can change stability conditions. Like you, with the, if you have a MGN bar with points, you can put some weights on those points and there's Hassett stability. And there has been work on how the cotangent lines change. I mean, the, the integrals of the cotangent lines change with this uh, different Hassett stability. And I think even some work about the, uh, the constraints my memory is some paper of YP Lee and some others, but I'd have to look. But I think the, well, I mean, the answer somehow is that when you change the stability conditions in the way I was saying about MGN bar, the cotangent line integrals change in a more or less controlled way. And then you can propagate that through the constraints and somehow. But I, I think that YP wrote something about it, but I'll have to go look. I'll bring it to the, I'll bring it to the lecture tomorrow. Okay. Uh, have... And sorry, and if you do that for arbitrary targets, I would expect something similar. That they, let me maybe just say that one more thing about that. When you change these stability conditions in this way, maybe you have a more complicated way, but the way I'm talking about, it's changing gene of zero stuff. So you, you have kind of control about what's going on. We have one more question in the chat and I think we're gonna to have to finish afterwards. Uh, the question is, uh, what properties of invariance do you expect for the code schemes of funnels on, of non-torsion sheaves? Uh, so I would, I mean, I, I, I would guess the rationality would hold also uh, in terms of com exact formula. So yeah, the, 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 the general question, the general claim I would make is the rationality of that, that generating function is, uh, is still true. I don't know if that's true or not. We have a little evidence. I don't think we have much evidence. Doing exact calculations in rational and final cases turns out to be harder than in uh, the general type cases. And one finds that also in that in the Waffa Witten world. And somehow the philosophical reason for that is that, uh, well, my view is that the curve counting and rational surfaces is, is very rich and complicated, while the curve counting on surface of general type is very simple. So I don't expect there'll be uh, as uh, easy formulas to find or as, as, uh, as universal formulas to find in the Fano cases. But I would expect the rationality at least. All right. Thank you very much. Okay.